Hello, everyone. Uh, let's go ahead and get started, and I'm sure people will keep trickling into Adobe Connect while I go over some of our brief intro slides. Uh, welcome to our seventh webinar in the Arctos webinar series. My name is Emily Breaker, and I'm the Vertebrate Collections Manager at the University of Colorado Museum of Natural History, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Today we'll be talking about managing collect cultural collections in Arctos and demonstrating several of the Arctos tools available. Presenting for us all the way from the University of Alaska Museum of the North are Ag Angela Lynn, who is the Senior Collections Manager for Ethnology and History, and Archaeology Collections Manager Scott Shire. Teresa Mayfield from the Museum of Southwestern Biology is also joining us in the chat, and she'll be keeping up with your questions during the presentation. Um, so before we begin with the webinar content, I have a couple of quick logistics to go to cover. The first slide provides let me get there, some basics to familiarize you with Adobe Connect if you've not attended any of our previous webinars. Uh, so if you'd like to list your institution next to your name, you can do so by clicking on the list icon at the top of the attendees pod to edit your info as shown here. Um, and we encourage you to do so. Feel free to use the chat box to, to type in any questions or comments during the presentation and jump into any chat discussion that gets going. Uh, we may circle back at the end of the presentation for any unanswered or lingering chat questions. Um, your microphones are currently turned off to ensure good sound quality during the webinar, but I will turn them on at the end during Q&A for those of you who would like to speak. And we also do suggest using headphones rather than computer speakers for clearer sound quality. Um, and finally, one thing we like to request of our participants is that you take the short post-webinar survey following the presentation. You can see the URL here in the slide, um, and that's going to remain available up at the right-hand corner of your screen throughout the webinar. Uh, the survey only takes two to three minutes and provides iDigBio with valuable demographic information and us with important webinar feedback and gives you the chance to suggest future topics. So please take the survey, even if you've done so with our previous webinars. Next slide, here are some general Arctos links. We record all of our webinars, including this one, so you can find recordings of, at the URL listed if you'd like to listen to or share this webinar or view previous topics. You can find out more about Arctos in our user handbook, including how-tos and documentation to supplement this webinar. And finally, you can search our data at arctos.database.museum. Uh, these links will also be available in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Um, and lastly, I want to mention our next webinar topic on tissues, containers, and object tracking in Arctos, which will be on the second Tuesday in April at 3 p.m. You can copy the link here or find out more to find out more, and we hope you'll join us again. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn this over to Angie and Scott. Thanks, guys. Thank you. I think I just got our microphone unmuted. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> yeah, loud and clear. Thanks. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks everybody for logging in today to uh, learn about how Arctos is being used here at the University of Alaska Museum of the North for managing cultural collections. And um, if anybody isn't familiar with Arctos sort of in general, I would encourage you to go and take a look at one of the previous webinars. The very first one is a great one to learn about it uh, as a collections uh, management system and the, the community of Arctos. Uh, we'll be talking about it sort of in a general sense and, and some of the, the benefits of, of Arctos for us as a cultural collection coming into it, um, but if uh, if you want to go back and, and take a look at one of those earlier ones, it's a, a great introduction uh, for everybody. So that being said, um, I wanted to just give a real quick introduction for people who may or may not be familiar uh, with sort of the history of, of our collections. Um, the ethnographic and, and histor historical as well as archaeological collections at UAM were some of the uh, first collections that were made here at our museum back in 1926 when Otto Geist went out to uh, make those initial collections for the university. Through the years, uh, our collections were physically separated from one another, so um, our numbering systems and our agents, who are the people and organizations 
Um, and then the objects themselves, we, we've got a lot of overlap between um, our two collections. So it makes a lot of sense for us to work together on a lot of projects. Um, we, between the two collections, you know, we represent about 14,000 years of human occupation in Alaska. And so um, this project to move into Arctos has been uh, really exciting. Um, so we have uh, been introduced to, or sorry, um, the archaeology collection grows uh, primarily through professionally uh, initiated research and management projects based either in excavations at a particular site or through surveys of a region in Alaska. And they also serve as an official repository for both for uh, federal, state, and local agencies and, and have collections deposited on behalf of tribal entities. And they currently have about um, just over a million objects physically located in the collection. Uh, the Ethnology and History Collection grows mostly as a result through the generosity of private individuals who donate their family collections. And our objects range from clothing and tools to a wide variety of transportation devices, like an airplane, the first automobile in Alaska, and some really technologically sophisticated skin boats like umiaks and kayaks. And we've got about 16,000 objects in our collection. Um, our involvement with Arctos began in about 2013 when we were able to get funding through the Institute of Museum and Library Services to migrate our data out of uh, our old database called 4D uh, and move into Arctos. And that we spent about two years doing that. And in the fall of 2014, we were able to move into Arctos about uh, 5,000 new agents, um, about 8,200 accession records, nearly 370,000 specimen records, uh, 174 loans, and nearly 2,200 media files. Uh, as of right now, archaeology has about 611,000 specimen records total, and uh, ethnology and history has uh, just over 15,000. Um, so our biggest question when people um, find out that we have our collections online now is, uh, how do we actually find something? We have a lot of people who um, have had trouble, um, you know, playing around in Arctos and, and they just have trouble uh, finding anything. So we created, when we first moved in, we created a couple quick start guides. We each have on our websites um, a page like this one that gives a basic intro on how to navigate the search screen. Um, and well, that's pretty much what we're going to spend the bulk of our time going through today is um, taking you through each of these categories uh, that you can search by. And um, in addition to these that I've got posted on my web page, uh, archaeology adds a specific archaeological site um, as one of the, the criteria that, that folks can search through. So that introduction done, we're going to just go ahead and dive right in. Um, I'm going to be searching as a logged in operator. Um, in general, what we tell people if they're just going to search through uh, archaeology or ethnology collections, they would come to the portals here on the main page and, and they would pick over here, click on UAM, and then scroll down to either archaeology or to ethnology and history and search just through those specimens. And that'll help weed out uh, the other 3 million <laughs> specimens that are posted um, in the other collections, unless you want to do uh, that cross-disciplinary search, which we will talk a little bit about how we're setting up our collections to be discovered when people are searching for other things. Um, but for today, we're going to focus really on um, searching just through the cultural collections. So the first thing that we'll, you'll see when you arrive at the search page is um, a lot of information that may be labels that, that, that seem a little counterintuitive for searching for uh, cultural collections. Um, some of these are going to be, I've got these shown in the um, collapsed view right now, so, but each one of these search boxes has a little button here in the right that allows you to pop those open to see more options. And a couple of those we'll, we'll do um, as we get going. 
But the very first thing that if you already know what object you want to look for, um, you've got a catalog number, then uh, you can go ahead and just enter that directly in the catalog numbers field here. And now, hopefully a lot of the people who are logged in right now are people who work in cultural collections and you know how uh, catalog numbers for cultural collections tend to differ from those in other collections. This was one of the first hurdles that we had to jump across when we migrated into Arctos. For most cultural collections, the catalog number or the accession number or sort of embed certain kinds of information. Um, it's not just a random number. And so for those of you who maybe don't know how cultural collection mm -hmm. catalog numbers work, we use what's called a trinomial numbering system. And so your number is broken down into three parts. So the first number references the year that something came into the collection. The second number represents the sequence in which it came in. And then the third part of the number represents the, the number of objects that, that this person or this item represents. So this is the second A and B, the second two pieces in the seventh collection that came in to the museum in 2002. So that's just a real um, brief overview. So you put that number in. If you've been in the gallery and you've got a number written down, you've seen something in a publication, That'll get you immediately your one specimen result. Hopefully there should only be one result. Um, and that'll pop up here. You can see some basic information that shows in your summary view. And you can um, click right on the GUID, the Globally Unique Identification Number. And you'll get your, um, your record that pops up here. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of the page right here, but just so that you get a little eye candy, this is uh, the, the uh, artifact that we're going to be searching for in a couple different ways. So these beautiful Athabascan beaded mittens. Um, so catalog number, that's your, your easy peasy search. We'll go back out and find these in another way. Um, so you can search these by um, item name. So a lot of times people want to find all the baskets in the collection or all the parkas in the collection or all the mittens in the collection. So to do that, you go to the identification and taxonomy section. You click this over here to see more options. And what I like to do is I go right here into the identification box and I just put in mitten. Now I know these are mittens, but I want to put the smallest string in there. And we just recently um, had a wonderful change that includes the contains match type over here. And so uh, a lot of times, as you'll see when the results pop up, these things might be described as mittens, comma, decorated, mittens, comma, mans, mitten, comma, uh, something else. <laughs> so if you just put in the shortest string that you think is going to be in that descriptor and then hit contains, that's going to find all of those. So you hit search. And that's going to give us 135 specimens. Now, because I didn't click just ethnology, we've got a few archaeological specimens here as well. Um, but down here, you can see the results that popped up. And these are going to come, they're going to, by default, show up in the catalog number order. Um, and uh, so the these miscellaneous numbers down here, this is before we went into the trinomial numbering system. Um, so you can scroll, 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 and there's the guys that we're looking for right there. Okay, so I'm not going to open it because it's the same record. We know that it's there. Now this time I'm going to go just for ethnographic and historical collections. Again, if you're just out in the public view, if you click up here on collection, there's going to be a ton of different museums and collections. And if you want to just search for our stuff, you'll have to scroll through all of those. Find the UA Museum and click on either archaeology or ethnology or both. And then you'll just be searching through those particular records. So the next way that we're going to look uh, is by the people. So this was another one of the big changes when we moved into Arctos is, is um, you know, people for natural history collections are important primarily as collectors. Um, when you're dealing with cultural collections, as most of you probably know, um, the people and the stories and the events are the things that make 
cultural objects important that come into collections. And so we started to request more emphasis on people in, in Arctos. And so that has allowed us to put into place a few changes um, that other people are starting to use in their collections as well. And so that's been um, a great way for us to utilize this really flexible nature and, and the, the community aspect of being part of Arctos. So when we're looking for people, you don't even have to expand this one right here. You can just put somebody's name right in this box. And so uh, again, like with the identification, I suggest that people use the smallest string possible, either the first name or the last name, whichever one is sort of more unique and less likely to be misspelled over time. Um, so I'm gonna, since we're looking for this collection by, uh, that was assembled by uh, Frederick Drain, I'm gonna just put in Drain right here, and I'm gonna hit search through just ethnology. And that, uh, of course, because it's a contains search, is gonna pull up things that may have Drain within the name, um, but we can see right here, so our collector and maker columns are right there together. We can see, great, we've gotten all these really good Frederick Drain items as we scroll through. Oh, but now we see we've got an L Drain Jimmy. So that is not part of the collection that we want to find. So one of the way, things that you can do uh, to finesse your results is you can remove things from your search results that you don't necessarily want. So if you're going to download this data, you can click on that field right there, go up here, remove check rows. And it's going to refresh. And now we're down to 28. So again, there's the one that we were looking for. Okay. And, and so that will also give us, so we know these are all, because we can recognize that accession number, these are all part of that same collection from 2002 that came in. But we also have these other, this other collection that uh, Drain donated in 1975. If you are an operator, you can get this same information by going up to Manage Data, Agents, and you can put in Drain's name here. And you can see, oh, there's Eldrain Jimmy, but then here's Frederick Drain right there, and maybe some other people that are relevant. And so that pops up. You can see the summary. We've been using the agent remarks to put biographical information on that helps you distinguish between two or three different people who maybe have the exact same name. You can also include relationships in the agent. So you can see that he's the parent of Rebecca Drain Warren. And he's also the spouse of Rebecca Wood Drain. Um, in that area, then, you could go to the agent activity report and get a list of all the items that he uh, is associated with from this place. And then you click on there, and that gets you back to those 27 specimens. So a couple different ways that you can get back to that same, that same result. Okay, one more way that you can search um, and that people often search for cultural collections are by culture. So culture in Arctos for the cultural collections is listed as an attribute. And the attributes are, are, are specialized data that associate with that actual individual object record. So you go down here to specimen record and you click on more options. And you can see right here, there's a Drop down list that gives you lots of <laughs> attributes. Every collection can pick their own attributes. And so um, there's a lot to sort of filter through. But uh, for us, you can go to culture of origin, and that's a good one that we like to use. And if you don't know, um, all of our, our uh, pick lists or drop down menus in Arctos are. are uh, controlled by uh, code tables. So you can click on the vo controlled vocabulary link there, and that'll give you a link over here to the code table for culture. And so you can see how we have developed uh, a code table that represents cultures from primarily Alaska in the north, but also in different areas. Because we are the first uh, cultural collections in Arctos, it's pretty heavily weighted to Alaska, Canada, the Circumpolar North. 
but there are uh, folks in other places around the world as well. So if you don't know what information to put into your culture of origin list, that's where you can go to make sure you get good results. So you would just put in, so this one we know we're looking for Athabascan. And so you just put that in, and this is going to give us all the objects in the Ethnology and History Collection that have been uh, identified as Athabascan. Um, and that's going to give us, it takes us a little bit longer to find that one, but that gives us almost a thousand specimens right there that, that get kicked out. Um, again, you can sort by whatever column you want up here. And because um, we've got almost a thousand, I'm going to go ahead and sort it by the collector since we know we're looking for a particular person and um, we're going to scroll down and it it sorts it by the first name so we're looking for reverend <laughs> so we're going to have to go down to our bottom and you can show however many you want in your search results i've got 100 shown here but you could could show oh so you go up a little bit for some reason so oh yeah it'll oh. so <laughs> because of the way that um uh, if, it, if we were sorting by catalog number, the 2000s will show up before um, the uh, like 69s. <laughs> um, but so we've got, we're only on the Ds here, so we're probably going to need to go to like the third page or so. Let's see where we can go. There's Fs and Hs. We'll go someplace here in the middle. Maybe it's up here with the, those are all of our unknowns. Lots of unknowns. Sorry, I should have figured out which page I was going to be on. Ones we use. So here we go, ours. And up here, there's our purple one that we've already looked at before. So there it is. So you can get, you can cast a really wide net or you can cast a really small net when you're looking at things like that um, with, with the attributes. One last attribute that um, might be of use for researchers um, who are particularly interested in decorative elements, sometimes people will look um, for certain keywords within the description. And this is another way that cultural collections are a little different from uh, natural history specimens is that we, <laughs> we've been trained to fully describe uh, the item as if that thing is not um, imaged right there. We're lucky we, we archivists can accommodate a lot of images in each record. And so um, you don't have to be as diligent about describing uh, every little bit nook and cranny of an item anymore. But we still do for the most part because researchers may want to narrow things down. So for example, this particular one, maybe somebody's interested in how tulips have been represented as a decorative element in beadwork. So we can put tulip in there and see what shows up in the ethnographic collections as well. And that'll take a couple seconds because it's going through a bit, an attribute that has a lot of information in it. Um, sometimes these descriptions can be quite extensive. And there we go. And so there you can see when we went go into the record itself and we come over here to the description we can expand this so you can see this is a pretty decent sized one um, but it sorted through all of this and found tulip right in there because of course on our item we've got tulips shown on the thumb and up here on the cuff um, so maybe somebody's really interested in the use of blue beads or moose hide or, uh, you know, some other material um, in that description. So I'm going to kick back over to our search page here and hand it over to Scott to talk a little bit more about some other ways that um, these uh, different criteria can be used to find archaeological specimens. Cool. Thanks, Angie. So, sorry, I got to get used to using a Mac here. <laughs> PC user myself. So, um, 
So in addition to the, the ways that Angie just showed, I mean, she was focusing on ethnology and history collections, but you can use all of those methods to search through the archaeological collections as well. And then I also wanted to highlight um, a few additional ways that you could also search um, both collections, although I'm going to use, I'm going to show examples um, within the archaeology collection. So, um, so the first one that I wanted to do was by geographic location. So a lot of times when I get contacted um, by researchers or archaeologists that um, want to inquire about collections, um, a lot of times they're just focused on a specific region in Alaska. Um, and so in order to do that, we would search through um, this locality page. And so I'm going to actually show more options. So we get the drop down menu and that's going to show all the different ways that you can search by locality. But really, I only use um, I really only use one search criteria within here, and that's searching by USGS quad map. Um, and so a couple of different ways that you can use this, uh, this tool. So you can, if you know which quad you want to search um, and you know how it's spelled and how it's referred to um, within Arctos, you can just type it right into this box. But one um, cool feature is this link over here where you can just pick which USGS quad that you want to search. And it'll, it'll bring you to this page. Um, how do I scroll down? That's a way to track. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Magic mouse. Um, so yeah, and then it's broken up by different regions of Alaska. So starting with interior, northern Alaska, south central Alaska, you can just scroll all the way through. And um, so I'm going to use, I recently had um, some inquiries about the Barrow Quad. So I'm going to use that as an example. Um, so then you just come over and you can just click right on Barrow Quad. Um, and then that's going to select it here. It'll select Barrow into that box and then you... Um, you want to come here and we're going to check on just archaeology collections. So we're just searching those and then click the search tab. And it's going to take a minute. So um, so we're searching through 611,000 records. So a lot of times, oh, wow, maybe Angie's computer is just faster than mine. Um, so usually when I search, it takes a lot longer. But um, so that's going to bring up the results for every single individual artifact that we have from the Barrow Quadrangle um, in Alaska. And so for those of you that might not know, um, archaeological sites are tracked by the State Office of History and Archaeology through the AHRS database. And so AHRS just stands for Alaska Heritage Resource Survey, and that's a, a working database of all the historic archaeological and paleontological um, sites in Alaska. And so that's how kind of how we organize our collections here are through um, those AHRS numbers. So individual sites have an individual AHRS number. Um, so by searching the Barrow Quad, we brought up um, every single artifact that we have for every single AHRS site within that entire quadrangle. Um, and so it's a list of 13,166 specimens. Um, so that's a good way for researchers or maybe cultural resource managers that are going to work on projects in the Barrow Quad, um, and they're interested in um, collections that already exist for that entire quad, they can search the collections that way. Um, so the next way that I wanted to show folks how to search collections is just by AHRS number. So if you have a specific site that you're going back to or a specific site that you're interested in working on, um, and you want to search it that way, it's you can, we're going to come back up to this identifiers box at the top of the page, and we'll need to show more options. Um, so this is the same way that Angie was showing. You can search by catalog number, but what we're going to do is search by other identifier type. Um, so if you click here, you have a drop-down menu, and it's it's similar to that attributes menu, and that um, there are a lot of different options because every single um, Museum and every single department has its own way that they want to search collections, but we have this HRS um, option here. So you just check that box, and then you can come up and close it. And then other identifier is, again, you can choose is or contains. I usually just do is. And then, um, so I'm going to stick with searching in the Barrow Quad, and I'm going to um, search to the Bernerk site, which is a really well known, famous. Um, archaeological site from the Barrow Quad that um, we've had a lot of research interest in lately. So you just um, type in the full HRS number, including those leading zeros, because that's how um, we record all HRS sites 
and the archaeology databases with all of the um, five digits. And then you close a search. And take a moment. Cool. So then that brings up the search results for everything that we have from the Burner site. So when we searched for the entire barrel quad, we had 13,000 plus um, artifacts. And then when you narrow it down, you can see that 9,420 of those are from the Burner site. And so this is going to bring up every single accession for the Burner site. Um, so most of it relates to this UA 2012 51 accession. Um, which are actually um, artifacts that were excavated in the 50s, but um, they weren't deposited here at our museum in two, in, in until 2012. Um, but prior to that, we just had a single artifact from that collection that was um, made back in the early days of the museum before we went to that trinomial numbering system. Um, so that's the second important way to search the archaeological collection. So geographical region, AHRS number, um, but then if you got to this point and you were seeing all these diff all the different accessions for the Burnerk site, but maybe you just wanted to see um, the artifacts from the 2012-51 accession, um, we'll go back to the specimens page. And so you can, if you know, similar to if you know the exact catalog number for a specific object that you want to look at, you can enter it there. But if you just know the accession number that you want to search, you can also just enter it under this accession tab. So UA... 2012-051, and I'll limit it again to the archaeology collections, even though it should only bring up archaeology collections. So that should be a unique accession number just to that Burner site. And so this should bring up, yeah, 9,419 9, records. And then, so you can narrow it down that way. And then again, as Angie was showing, if you're just interested in a specific artifact type from that site, you can sort it here. Um, but then let's just go in and look at one of the archaeology records. Um, so yeah, you can see the collector, who the preparator was. Um, once it was deposited here at the museum, uh, it lists the, just all the pertinent information about that we know about the object. So which site it came from, the site name. Um, and then we have a number of different attributes um, within those attributes fields. So archaeological feature, culture of origin, a description, the material type that it's made out of. Um, and then we're just, um, the ethnology and history collection, most of their objects have photos. We're just um, trying to get caught up with that ourselves. But the Burner collection is a good one that we have. Um, we have photos that come with it. So this one. This particular object is this really cool ivory ivory chain that's been carved out of a, a single piece of ivory. Um, so, yeah. So then, um, so yeah, and then you can just scroll through, and I'm going to go back to the search page. So then, um, the last way that I want to, or no, I got two more ways that I wanted to show. So the second one's material type. So as I was saying, um, so one way that we get a lot of requests from researchers are they're interested in a specific site or a specific region, but then we also have a lot of um, inquiries just about specific material types. So we might have people that are just interested in researching ceramics in Alaska or wooden artifacts or obsidian, for example. Um, so we're going to come back down to this specimen record field um, and back to this attributes table that um, Angie was showing you guys how to search description. So there's, in addition to description, there's this materials attribute as well, um, which is really useful for identifying artifacts made out of specific material types. So um, one really big material type that people research in Alaska is obsidian. Um, so we'll choose materials, type in obsidian, scroll back up, make sure that we're just searching the archaeology collections here at Museum of the North. And then click that search tab again. And so this should bring up every single artifact that we have um, information entered into the database for um, that's, that's made out of obsidian. So, um, so one sort of um, sticking point there is that we estimate we have over a million artifacts, but um, we just have 611 some thousand actually entered into the database. So 
there are a lot of artifacts that we have in the collection here that when you're searching the database in this manner that um, you're not necessarily going to be able to find just because they're not in the database yet. So this brings up the results for every single obsidian artifact that we have in the database. So 11,698. And then people, you mean you can bring up these results and scroll through them if you're interested in a specific um, site. You can come back to the search field again. Um, and we'll have to start over. But you could enter, you could go back down to this materials page, pick the attribute or the specimen record page, pick the materials and the attribute, type in obsidian. But if you want to know every obsidian that we have from the barrel quad, then you can start to get a little more complicated and start mixing and matching different attributes. So you could come in and pick, um, again, pick the barrel quad and then come down to pick an attribute, go back down to materials and pick obsidian. And you can start to get a little more specific with things too. Just to, so it can be a little more tailor made for your research interests or what you're interested in finding. It's important to always make sure you try to limit this so you're not searching three and a half million records <laughs> at once. Or a lot of times it'll time out on you. You have to start over. Um, that's surprising. I thought some of those Bernard items would have been obsidian. Um, but that's good to know. We don't have any obsidian from the Barrow Quad. <laughs> um, so you can start and mix and match that way. Yeah. Um, and then the last way that I wanted to mention, or just to highlight ways that we can search the collections, and this is something that we're just beginning to scratch the surface on, is through, we're going to come back to this identification and taxonomy box um, and show more options. So, so this is where Angie was showing you how to search based on the artifact name. So this is where we were searching for mittens. Um, you can do the same for archaeology collections. If you're interested in projectile points or microblades or microblade cores, you can search there. Um, but what I specifically wanted to highlight was how we're starting to link up um, scientific name with some of our collections. So if, if we have like a, an antler projectile point that's made out of caribou, um, we could type in ranger for tarandus, which is the scientific name for caribou, and, and tie it to that antler projectile point. Because um, a lot of times we'll get researchers that want to come in and they're interested in um, just the, the sort of past environmental um, conditions. So they're interested in knowing sort of the how the caribou were distributed 2,000 years ago. Um, so they might it's good for them to know that we have collections um, that are made of caribou. So they could come in and sample that and radiocarbon date it or do DNA analysis um, to get a better idea of like, caribou distribution um, throughout the prehistoric past um, in Alaska. Um, so just as an example, we have very few that we actually have, we just have started trying to make these connections. Um, and one of the big ones we've um, done so far is for collections down on um, the Alaska Peninsula that were recently deposited. So I'm going to do a search for seal. And so that brings up um, all the different seal specimens that we have in the collection um, so far. And, and they're all pretty much from the same quad, this the false pass quad, which is down on the Alaska Peninsula. Um, and like I said, we're just getting started with this. But as we start to add more and more, um, if you go into search seal, eventually it's going to bring up thousands and thousands of records. Um, and then again, you can start to um, limit or get more focused if you're interested in seal from a certain um, a certain site or a certain time period or a certain geographical region in Alaska, you'll be able to um, go in and just target those collections that you want to try to access a little bit, a little bit more specifically. Um, so again, here I'm just in inside the artifact record for um, this one spiel, set, spiel specimen from XFP31, uh, but you can see it's a thoracic vertebrae. Um, and then you can see where it's collected from test pit three at this site, 60 to 90 centimeters below surface. Um, yeah, so those are just a, a few different ways of how we kind of search. It's more tailor made for archaeological collections, maybe, as opposed to, but there's a lot of overlap with ethnology and history as well. Um, just in terms of people being interested in specific material types or geographic locations or specific collections or sites. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what I had for archaeology. And then from here, 
Um, we thought if we have time, where do we have time? Oh, okay. So we've got a few minutes left. I don't know if we want to go in and look at some specific records to show. Or yeah, to... what I thought I would do next is to take a look at um, a couple of what we sort of qualify as kind of gold standard records where we've been able to go beyond just the basic information in our record and start taking advantage of the, the vast resources that we have either in our collection files or in resources that exist out um, in the web, you know, out in other people's databases and, and that kind of thing. So one of the records that I wanted to highlight from, from our collection is a camera that was collected by or used by Frederick Schwatka. Um, he was a, a military guy who was part of the search um, the, the reconnaissance mission that the military did in um, the mid-19th century. And we've got this very cool camera that was donated um, back in 1968. You can see here's its full catalog number, the name, where it was made, the date range. All of this information is up here in the header. And then um, for each one of our records for the ethnographic and historical collections, we have three locations and dates that we record with every single item. This was another one of those um, elements that made um, folks who used Arctos um, kind of head explode when we started moving our data in or talking about the data that we wanted to bring in. Prior to, the, to our collections going into Arctos, pretty much every record had one, what's referred to as a specimen event. Um, is basically where it was collected and when it was collected. Um, we think it's very important to track what's referred to as the social life of the object. You can learn about a lot about the, the history of the object and sort of the lives that it's touched um, through tracking the place and the date of manufacture, the place and the date and context of its use, and the place and the date of its collection. Um, and so we create an individual specimen event that each of those may be the same or they may all be completely different. And so this is one that shows really nicely um, some differences in all of those fields. So this camera was made uh, sometime around 1884. This was something that we were able to take the patent number for this particular camera. This is the advantage of these man-made items that have things like patent dates. Um, look it up. Um, and then we knew the year that Schwatka reputedly used the camera. So we've got a nice tight date of its date of manufacture sometime between 1884 when the patent was filed and 1886 when Schwatka apparently used it. Again, its date of use is listed here, 1886. And the, the events are great that you can actually qualify this information in the event remarks and say why you've selected a particular range for your event dates. And then the date of collection um, is, is uh, within the, that same date range, and we've qualified that. Uh, so that's the, all the, the location information. We can also map those things through coordinates, and that would give us, if we had done that, we would have a little map, a little Google widget map that would pop up right there and give us a really nice pinpoint on the map where that's at. Uh, our collectors, so we can have us, as many collectors or makers as we want to have associated with this. I should actually have one more collector listed on this one who would be the donor um, because he inherited it from his aunt who was, uh, I think, a niece of Schwatka. Um, this part information, this has to do with the condition of the item, um, or uh, in this particular case, it's the media. So these are, we have five photographs um, that document this piece. And then this is our basic condition report. It's in the collection. And then this information is masked from the public view. This is its physical location. We've started to barcode our collections as a result of a grant through the Museums Alaska. And so as we, a barcode our items, that information gets put into uh, this column right here, the PL path, and that will give us a much more accurate um, and real-time update of its location where we, we house it. 
Um, the attributes are over here. So we've got, oops, I don't want to edit. I just want to expand so we can see that this is a non-native item and there's a good description with some dates and um, measurements. And then the, the cool thing that we've started to do then with our collections is, is track uh, what we refer to as the intangible cultural heritage. A lot of that, the stories or the relationships between people, the knowledge that people have on how to make things, um, you can capture that to a certain extent um, through just writing things out. You can also attach them as media, either as audio files or video files or text files. Um, so for this particular record associated with the accession, we were able to scan our accession information and attach it as a PDF. And so that helps to document the, the history of this particular piece. And we've got that uploaded as a PDF. We've redacted some personal information in there, which is his address. It's got its letter of authentication um, from someone, and it was notarized back in 1954. So that's a cool way that we're able to get some of that paper file stuff in our lab associated with this collection. Um, we've got photos, the different angles, great close-up shots of uh, things that help identify the item like that, and then some of that other media that would be really interesting for people to see the newspaper article that documented the camera coming to the museum when it was initially donated. So that's a cool record that I just wanted to share. Um, another one that mirrors what Scott was showing about adding the different um, materials in a record is this parka that uh, was donated back in 91. It is um, a really beautiful parka that um, is, is associated with uh, Tishu Yulin from Wise Men. You can see this one has been uh, geolocated. We've got coordinates that were put in and our map shows Wise Men right there. So you can click on that one and this parka was made from, according to its description, caribou, wolf, wolverine, and, and uh, calf skin. So what we have done is we've entered those really general scientific names into the identification up here. And so <clears throat> what this allows people to do then is if they're searching for the whole, through the whole Arctos, you know, three and a half million specimen records, um, if somebody's looking for wolf, um, this is going to show up in their wolf search because we have gone ahead and we've entered Canis lupus in there as an identification of a material. Um, that's, as Scott mentioned, if people are interested in um, environmental studies or the distribution of certain animals across space and time, um, that will allow people to see this parka, which we know was made pre-industrial time period, probably. Um, and that, you know, that might be important to somebody who's doing research on caribou, or on, sorry, on, on, uh, on wolf uh, populations in Alaska. Um, what's super cool about this one is we, we have the parka photographed here. And when I was doing some research on Tishu Yulin, um, I was just doing a Google search and I came across this photograph that is over in Alaska's digital archive. So what Arctos allows us to do is to create media in Arctos that's actually, that lives someplace else. So all of these different databases that, that house cultural information around the world, if they have a relevance to our specimens in our collections, those objects in our collections, we can link out, um, you can see that it's a, the thumbnail is the, the photograph but it's actually, it lives over here at Alaska's Digital Archive. So now what we've done is we've driven traffic over to another database that has, look at there's Tishu wearing the parka from our collection. She's in Wiseman. This gives a lot of really cool context to the objects in our collection. And now I can go, now that I'm over here, I can actually look up Tishu and I can find all these other photographs that are held in this other database and now I can see Tishu with her children 
when when they were young and i can see people in the community um when she was when she was young you know she's must be in one of these um kids in in this picture so you know this is a great way that we can show the importance of our collections and the connection to other resources that are out there on the web. I'm going to let Scott show how they're doing that with some of the archaeological collections. Yeah, so that's kind of the next <clears throat> big step for us. A lot of the of records for ethnology and history are much uh, richer in detail in terms of the specific information. And so since we first got into Arctos, um, the major push for archaeology collections has been just to get our records in there. and then. So we've done really well with that, I feel like. I mean, we've almost doubled the amount of um, records we have in the database um, in the last four years or so. Um, so we're going to continue that push, but then also moving forward is just trying to add in a lot of this contextual information and have it all in one spot um, for people to find um, when they come to search our records. So um, one that I wanted to show off was... Um, is that going to work? Oh, it'll right click. Okay. technical difficulties with using a Mac here. Um, so this is a record from um, what we call the Beishimo collection. Um, so the Beishimo collection is really interesting and it could probably actually be um, in the ethnology and history collection as well, but it's actually, um, it's a collection of ethnological objects from uh, the Canadian Arctic taken off of a ship named the Beishimo. And the Beishimo was, uh, was an ab abandoned Hudson's Bay Company cargo steamer. Um, the SS Beishimo, and it was sort of legendary as an abandoned sort of quote-unquote ghost ship that sort of floated around the Bering Sea ice pack for 30 years. And at some point while it was, in a, it was abandoned, people boarded the ship and collected objects that were left behind on it when the ship was originally abandoned. Um, and then a small selection of those, um, of those artifacts were donated to Otto Geis, who then um, donated them to the museum in sort of a roundabout way. But this is... Um, I was going to highlight this one Ulu from this collection because um, this is just um, so we don't have as much of the contextual background information for each individual object but this is as of right now this is a good example of a pretty complete um, artifact record for the archaeological collection so it has collectors, preparators, um, where it came from. You can link into that um, accession record to get a little bit more um, context about it. But where it's located out in the in our, in our um, artifact storage, what it's made out of. Um, but then, so most of the records that we have in Arctos have that basic information. Um, but as we move forward, um, and we're trying to seek out future grants for this, but it's to add in photos, but then also scanning all of the hard copy accession records and get those added as text. But um, here, for an example, we have a link to. Uh, a research article that was published um, that references um, the Beishimo and will tell you everything you want to know about the history of that collection and the history of the ship. Um, uh, more details and photographs about all the other artifacts. So then we have artifact records for each one of these in Arctos as well. So as we're moving forward um, and getting beyond just getting the basic information about objects in, now we want to start to go back and add in a lot more of this contextual information. Um, so, like I said, accession, everything we have in the accession records, but then adding even, um, right now, we the photos that we do have are just kind of like basic one-shot photos, but maybe trying to get photos of both sides. And then um, moving forward, too, it seems like a trend now. We're getting a lot of researchers coming in and doing 3D scans. So as we move forward, um, we're going to try to figure out how we can start to add those 3D scanned files where people could actually um, get, get small views of those 3D scans, but then also um, if they wanted to, they could request larger files where they could download and then actually print, do some 3D printing um, for artifacts where if you have somebody that's located halfway around the world and they want to um, research um, projectile, stone projectile points from the late Pleistocene, they could request those 3D records and print their own small collection and then maybe they don't even have to travel here to, to do their research, which would be cool. But, um, and then I don't know if we have 
have time to talk about projects at all? I'm going to jump in super fast just to show one of the things because we advertise that this is something that we're starting to do. So Arctos also has the ability to have publications and projects associated with specimens. And so what we're starting to do to track our NAGPRA work is we've created or we're in the process of creating a project for each federally recognized tribe in Alaska and any of the ones that we have interacted with um, through our consultations or any sort of communication that we've had with them. Um, there are about 227 federally recognized tribes in Alaska, I think. So you can see we only have 69 right now, but we're moving forward. Um, and so our goal will be, as I said, each, uh, each tribe will have a, a project. And then within that project, we're able, I'm going to scroll down to the very bottom here to our Sea Alaska one, because that um, is a good one that we've actually been able to um, work a little bit more with. So if you click on the project, that opens up the page. And what we've done is we're, these are really designed for research projects, but uh, again, we're adapting it to our own use. And so within each project, you have the federally recognized tribe um, as the primary group. And then, um, and in this case, it's the nonprofit, uh, Sea Alaska. And then um, any of the uh, village corporation or the regional corporation that might be associated with that community or um, that federally recognized tribe would be listed as sponsors. And then what we can do is we can, in Arctos, we can create loans that are just data loans, so it's just information. And so we can create a, a loan and then attach that or associate that with a project. So you can say, this is the loan page that I created for some communications that I went into uh, in 2006 with the um, cultural resources coordinator from Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. Now, this um, is not publicly available, this information. Um, but eventually, um, you know, so what we can do is we can track every correspondence that we've had and then we attach the objects to that loan. And so then we can see that we uh, sent a report of 65 artifacts or objects to these, these folks um, in response to a request that they had for items in our collection that, that may be um, uh, subject to being claimed under NACPRA. And this is, uh, you know, just a new way that we are working to keep track of how we're communicating with, with folks and how the individual objects um, are being uh, associated with our NACPRA compliance. So that's just a super brief overview on, on how we're using the structure within Arctos to do something that was never really designed um, to handle um, when you're dealing with cultural collections. So that is the um, quick show me the Mona Lisa on double parked version of searching um, Arctos for cultural collections. And I guess at this point we can open it up to, um, to any sort of uh, questions that people might have. I don't know if, if any questions came up while we were, uh, while we were talking. Great, thank you both. That was excellent. So yeah, as Angie mentioned, we do have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, and for all of you who've been listening, I, I did enable everyone's microphones. If you'd like to ask a question, go ahead. Um, you might need to just click on the microphone icon at the top of uh, your screen to turn it green in order for us to hear you. Uh, you can also use the chat. I see someone maybe was typing in there. Um, and while you are generating some questions. I am going to just quickly paste that um, survey link into the chat. Please, please, um, it's super quick to fill out, but it's really helpful to have your feedback. Um, and it's IDIG Bio with funding. So if, if you can take a moment at the end um, just to fill that out, that would be awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I see Florida is typing. Um, yeah, I also want to mention thanks uh, to you both, Angie and Scott, that really, um, You've really pushed a lot of developments and improvements into to Arctos, and it really demonstrates the ways that um, Arctos can be customized sort of to meet the different types of collections and also specific institutional needs. So, 
Yeah, thanks, Lindsay, for your question. We absolutely love it when people use uh, Arctos for research. And that's one of the great things about actually creating your uh, a login for yourself. You don't have to be an operator to have uh, a, uh, a, uh, um, a profile. But what you can do is when you're doing your searches, then you can save the results into your save. You can create a bunch of saved searches. And, and so you don't have to, you know, you can have a customized um, uh, a set of results and then you can just save that so you don't have to go through and, and find all those, those different ways of doing research. Once you've got your records assembled, then you can just click on that URL and it will pull up those results and you can send those results to anybody. And so this is something that I do a lot is where I actually do a search for someone See if that one's going to come up. It's taking a little. There's a little bit of a lag, um, but I can share the results of these searches then um, with community members, um, with a researcher who hasn't, you know, been able to um, really, you know, dig down into the search criteria yet. Um, and measurements are things that we each collection sort of deals with the the measurements in a different way. We embed ours, you can see in this one over here in the description, we end every description with our height, our width, and the depth of the individual artifact in centimeters. Um, does archeology span have a separate field for that? Uh, a lot of times it falls into that description field, yeah. Um, but it would be, that's a good idea to maybe have it as separate attributes. Yeah, and I think that that's My experience in archeology span is a lot of folks like to come and take their own measurements mm -hmm. as opposed to trust what might may or may not be in the database too. So <laughs> right. kind of exactly. depends how much faith you might have in that, in the data that you're just downloading from the database. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I'll add that you certainly can make measurements uh, sort of atomic attribute values. So it could be separated out so that it's even um, really easily searchable if some if a researcher were coming in the front end and you can um, from from the screen actually download into a spreadsheet so um, you don't have to be an operator in order to get that data so that could be right yeah so that'll it'll download it into a CSV file which you can then open as an Excel file and manipulate those uh, those columns and those individual fields in any way uh, that you want to do. So that's a great point. Thanks for reminding me about that as well. Great. Other questions? Um, yeah, if any of you have any questions, go ahead and type. I, I do want to mention too, I believe you might have said this too, Angie, um, our first webinar, if you ever want to look through the recordings, you know, this covered so much. Um, that one also touches on, on some of um, the other tools, permits, accessions, loans, project pages that um, we got to at the very end that if you wanted to explore those more, um, you, know, you can kind of go back through the archives and watch those as well. So yeah, that was great. And you know, we covered a lot of stuff really quickly. So if yeah. you go out and you try to um, use these techniques and you come up with zero specimen results, um, just shoot us an email. Um, every collection portal has um, contact information. Um, you know, you can you can go and find our home pages, um, our website pages for uh, the various collections through the portals, and and you can also um, Every page in Arctos has a little button down at the bottom, report a bug or request support. And that's a great one if you're stuck. Um, and that'll just go out to, I think, the Arctos working group members, or there's a number of people who will get that uh, email sent to them through Arctos. And then uh, the people who are most able to, to answer that question will, will take on answering it. Um, but, you know, it, as you begin to use it or if you as users have questions or come up with things that you think would be valuable for us to be tracking or uh, keeping um, data on um, you know this is again the great thing about Arctos is that we have the ability to make changes um, and, and push how we're keeping track of information and, and um, we have certainly pushed <laughs> Arctos uh, into some new new areas as we've moved into there and and hopefully that means it's it's better for everybody so definitely oh we've got someone typing
and and definitely you know if you have questions about um, different elements um, within um, you know our collections uh, you know there are all those other webinars um, there this is the seventh there's you know another one coming up um, and and because it's a community because this is a database that houses everybody's collections you know I'll just log out and you can see um, you know, there's three and a half million records. There are, you know, all of these collections with 25 different institutions and 139 collections. Um, there are new ways of, of using information and, and keeping track of things. So um, we'd love to hear what new interesting things people are doing. We're, we're experimenting with video and audio recordings and, and all kinds of different kinds of media files. So. It's a pretty exciting time to be part of, of Arctos, <laughs> and uh, hopefully everybody has learned a little bit uh, today on, on how to get to the, the cultural collections in Arctos. So thank you all for joining us today. Thanks. Thanks so much.